Well, well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm back, bitches, and back with the biggest video I've made since the end of the year video. Now, I've been on YouTube for a couple of years now, and I never properly made an introduction about me or my love for movies. I say this because whenever YouTubers do this kind of thing, it's usually a story of how they fell in love with the movies, a video about themselves and the movie that changed their life, and of course, a big video of their favorite movies. But move aside, fuckers, because it's my turn, and I am three years too late. Believe it or not, this video has been in the works for about a year now, not because I had failed drafts of a script, not because I couldn't find time, but because of the list itself. I originally thought of splitting this into two parts or just a trilogy, but history shows I don't like doing that. Then I had compiled a top 50 list, but I had more movie stats, so then I said fuck it, I'll do a top 60. But then I still had more film stats, so I went back to 50, but then I devised a fair idea if the movies are somehow related to one another, then they will all share a slot. And yes, this took a fucking year. I finally settled with this list, and I do not want to go the fuck back for another year. There will be two-way or three-way ties. If you know me, I will have some animated drama, superhero, thriller, horror, action, and comedy. I will go in depth, you can tell just by the length of this video, and I will even add on why each film is special and holds a close place to my heart. So without further ado, here is my top 60 favorite movies of all time. Give me the bat, Marge! Give me the bat! Give me the bat! Come on! Give me the bat! Give me the bat! 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 Scaredy <laughs> cat! Yeah. <laughs> the Shining is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, horror movie of all time. Spoilers, but there's like two or three other Kubrick films on this list. The thing that has always drawn me to Kubrick's movies is the characters. He takes the most interesting, fucked up individual and makes them relatable and feel human. In this movie, Kubrick asks the question, can a normal human be a psychopath? Now I didn't read the novel, but to keep it brief since we have a lot of movies to talk about, the Overlook Hotel represents hell. Jack Nicholson plays Jack Torrance, a man who goes from being a normal family man to a man who brings out his inner demons without even confronting them. Despite what Stephen King's old ass thinks about this movie, this has become an iconic staple in cinema. Just look at the most iconic gags. <laughs> Yeah, fall work and no play makes Stewie a dull boy. Everyone just wants to prove that Randy's gone crazy. Well, don't mind Randy, he's just losing his mind. Grr. You know what? Fuck you and Emily. You must be willing to do anything. No! No, I won't do it! Leave him out of this, he's just a little boy! Hey, Stan. Stanny Moore! I'm coming! Oh, look, wedding crashers! <laughs> Jenny! Don't! David Letterman! Hi, David! I'm Grandpa! Don't! Every shot within this film's incredible production screams Kubrick's perfectionist style, everyone from Nicholson to Duvall and even Danny Lloyd. Watching this whole family crumble is funny yet relatable. Do I need to call the police? Here, you can use my phone. Don't worry, it won't make you deaf because I'm not a hack. Hey! You're going to see a lot of Christopher Nolan on this list. It's crazy because this isn't even my favorite drama or thriller that this man has made. So why is this one of my favorite movies? I like characters that I can find relatable. Alfred and Robert are magicians looking to perfect the magic trick of a lifetime. A relationship with these two goes from friendship to competition to war and a battle to the death. When I first saw this movie, I rented it from my local library. One, I liked Christopher Nolan, and two, the front said it's that good that you will want to watch it again immediately. I read that and said, fuck you, I rented Transformers 5 here and it said that exact same thing. But as soon as I got to the end, the next day, I watched it again. This movie has one of my favorite twists in all of cinema, alongside Fight Club, Usual Suspects, and Memento. The idea that Alfred Borden, the character, was just an identity shared with the twins and it didn't matter who was who and when, where, why, and how still makes my brain explode. And yes, David Bowie killed it as Nikola Tesla. Hey, can you make us X-Men? What a surprise. 
Remember when I said this list has ties? Well, here's the first one. X-Men is one of my favorite movie franchises of all time. This also was the one that stuck with me the most as time has gone on. The ones that made me think, damn, that was a good fucking movie were Days of Future Past, Deadpool 1 and 2, and Logan. Let's talk about Days of Future Past first. This to me is the finale to the X-Men series. Yeah, Logan and the Deadpool movies are the final ones, but Days of Future Past has a sense of finality to it. If you've been watching these movies for as long as I have, this movie is rewarding. I like the idea of Logan having to go back in time and change the past, the arc that both Charles and Mystique go through, is really impactful. Not to mention this movie blends two generations of X-Men movies. The end of this movie still gives me chills. But by the end of this movie, it's cool to see where Logan, Charles, and Magneto end up. And a tear does shed every time by the end of this movie. But with Logan, it's a bit different. While I enjoy Days of Future Past more, Logan is more thrilling and depressing. Logan is slowly dying in this movie and serves as the last one remaining, but while most superhero movies serves as the dot dot dot, this movie ends in a period. James Mangold directed his heart and soul, but by the end of this movie, seeing Wolverine die is also like saying goodbye to someone you saw the evolution for for so long. The Deadpool movies, on the other hand, serve as the best kind of superhero movies. The best thing about these movies is the self-aware writing. Ryan Reynolds breaking the fourth wall and admitting to blackmailing Hollywood into making these movies is hilarious. You can't make me decide which one I like better. There are things Deadpool 1 does better and things Deadpool 2 does better. All in all, Deadpool's mere existence is just one giant middle finger. Every Stanley Kubrick movie is usually different from the last, and is often compared as the best movie of that genre. The Shining is considered the greatest horror movie, 2001 is considered the greatest sci-fi movie, so I think there's no exaggerating when I say Dr. Strangelove is the greatest satire of all time. Kubrick's mission with this film was to critique and satirize the missile gap that happened during the Cold War, where America thought the Soviet Union possessed superior missile capability. In turn, you get characters who are either goofy or moronic, with a script you could consider perfect. Peter Sell Sellers rocks as the president, the group captain, and of course Dr. Strangelove. Peter Sellers also famously is the first and only actor to be nominated for acting in three roles. The last 10 minutes of this movie alone could be hanged in a museum. The production is great, the sets are iconic, Kubrick's direction, the ending song all handled by Kubrick's gifted direction is truly remarkable. What better way to relaunch your showbiz career than getting inspired by the names on the Hollywood Walk of Fame? Ah, look at them all. Tilson Jennings. Vilma Banky. Oh, there's Chester Conklin. Ona Munson. Ralph Staub. Henry B. Walthall. What the fuck are these people? Tarantino is definitely up there as one of my favorite directors with Kubrick, Fincher, Nolan, Spielberg, and Scorsese. My top five from Tarantino always fluctuates depending on which one I rewatch, but one that never leaves the top five is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. This movie somehow left a bigger impact on me than any other movie that came out in 2019, with the inclusion of Ford v Ferrari and Joker. The first Tarantino movie I ever saw was The Hateful Eight, but Hollywood was the one that got me into Tarantino as a whole. A lot of people like making fun of this movie for being Tarantino's Disney movie, and yeah, it does kind of have that fairy tale aspect, but that's the idea. The idea of lost innocence after Sharon Tate got killed that gets flipped when she lives at the end. This movie is a tribute to Sharon Tate and the golden age of Hollywood, while also not being the main character. There are cameos and homages to stars like Bruce Lee, Natalie Wood, and even a ballsy Charles Manson cameo. The production design and costumes are the best in any Tarantino film. Cliff Booth and Rick Dalton lead this film as they navigate through the turn of Hollywood's new renaissance. Rick Dalton wants to be appreciated as a talent while also struggling to get his shit together. Cliff Booth serves as a chauffeur who also wants to be known as his friend instead of a murderer who tries to use that label for good by the end of the movie. The final 10 minutes of this movie is easily some of my favorite Tarantino. You are real, right? I'm as real as a donut, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> but the best thing about this movie is how everything comes full circle by the end. But everyone knows the real hero of this film was Brandy. So apparently James Cameron is taking his time on the sequel to Avatar. Remember Avatar? It had like no cultural impact, right? James Cameron's still working on his Avatar sequel. I mean, will people care after all this time? Avatar 2 is delayed again. I fucking love Avatar. This is another tie, because if you ask me, both movies are equally as fun. To me, anyone who doesn't like them hates fun and doesn't get how James Cameron makes everything 
every movie like this a blockbuster. Avatar scratches off every box I look for in a fun blockbuster. Cool monologue type characters, a creative and original world, non-stop action-packed climax, and effects that make me want to cry alone. Avatar was always hyped as the big movie that sucked ass, but the moment I watched it for myself, I loved it. Jake Sully is a phenomenal human being, easily one of the most trope-filled badass characters I have ever seen. By the first movie, he joins the Avatar experiment to complete what his brother couldn't, but falls in love with Pandora and Natiri. He fights against the team he was with and gets accepted into the culture. The last shot still gives me goosebumps. I waited years for Avatar 2 to come out, and damn was it worth it. Do I like it more than the original? No. But is it still dope as fuck? Yes. When the Tam dies by the end of the second movie, that took balls to pull off, and Jimmy did it successfully because he got the plan. Trust me, if you don't get how a big fucking Tolkien whale crashing down a military ship is cool, then consult a shrink. Until then, I will have fun with my 10 foot tall blue alien war movies. Thank you very much. I love this plan. I'm excited to be a part of it. Let's do it. And then all the Ghostbusters died. Alright, so Fargo and Ghostbusters might be the most interesting pairing, but I didn't know where to split these two, so they are tied. Let's talk about Ghostbusters. The thing about Ghostbusters is that it's one of those comedies from the 80s that you can easily put in a time capsule. This movie gets everything right, from the effects to the banter between the characters, the story, and the fact that it's hilarious. I mean, characters from Spangler, Stans, Winston, Janine, Dana, and Louis are all great. But we all know the best character is Peter Venkman. I feel like if I were a young teacher, Venkman is exactly what I would be like. The Ecto-1 is still one of my dream cars. I mean, with those new Ghostbusters movies going steady, they kind of make the time capsule message I'm trying to portray more valid. Not to knock any of the Ghostbusters movies besides the 2016 one, but this movie really works as one movie. I feel like everything that Ghostbusters is praised for will forever be attached to this one movie, and it is one timeless film at that. But Fargo is a more interesting film. Based on real life murders that occurred in Fargo, Minnesota, I've never seen a tighter crime film about arranged kidnapping that goes south be more intelligent than it gets credit for. William H. Macy hires two thugs to kidnap his wife for a small profit from his father-in-law to pay off his debts. But things start getting interesting really quick, because when Gare kills the state trooper and Francis McDormand gets involved, while the plan slowly crumbles in an hour and a half movie is crazy, Steve Buscemi easily steals the show as Carl Showalter, and an Oscar nomination was deserved. I'm sorry sir, we still got to charge you the four dollars. I just pulled in here. I just fucking pulled in here. Well, but... See, there's, there's a minimum charge of $4. Uh, Long-term parking charges by the day. I guess you think you're, uh, you know, like an authority figure? That stupid fucking uniform, huh, buddy? King clip on tie there, big fucking man, huh? You know, these are the limits of your life, man. Rule of your little fucking gate here, here. Here's your four dollars, you pathetic piece of shit. But it ends off being a critique of how people who hate their current state will do anything to get better or higher in life, in this case, for money. The scene in the cop car is very emblematic of this. I love too much about both of these movies, and it reminds me of how hard it is to put a list like this together. <laughs> I can't believe I almost gave you guys away! We're gonna go to college, it's gonna be great! You guys are the best! And we've been alive this whole time! <laughs> Toy Story is one of my favorite childhood movies. I like all of them, but the trilogy is what sticks out for me. Like Star Wars and The Dark Knight, you could argue this is a perfect trilogy. These movies prove that even animated movies can tell serious stories with important messages. From not being afraid to grow up, moving on, and holding on to every memory, by the end of Toy Story 3, it seems like a generation of people moved on and remembered how impactful this trilogy was for their younger years. Childhood can be fast. Some people might lose that time or let it all slip away once it's all over. Every Everything Toy Story teaches you ages better by time. That's an Aubrey Graham lip bite. Smoke Show takes one look at that and sees a fun, sensitive guy who's not afraid to show his soft side. This is my, this is him picture. Do ladies like Aubrey Graham? That's Drizzy Drake to you, Lewis. Another tie, this time with American Psycho and Child's Play. If you had to ask me, The Shining might be the greatest horror movie, but my favorite horror movie is Child's Play. The concept was original for the time before Hollywood ripped it a second asshole with Annabelle and Megan. Brad Dorif is Chucky. When I hear his voice, that's who I think of. You know something? It hurt. It hurt like a son of a bitch it even bled. And why is that, John? You're turning human. What? The 
more time you spend in that body, the more human you become. You mean I have to live out the rest of my life in this body? No fucking way! You got me into this, you get me out! I like how this is a slasher movie and a mystery movie all at the same time. This movie is iconic, it has its cheesy moments, but those moments make the movie funnier. Say what you want about the sequels, but half of them are fucking great. American Psycho, on the other hand, besides it serving as a commentary on corporate greed and Patrick Bateman being a metaphor for sadism and profit, this movie is a fucking comedy. I don't know what else to tell you, man. Christian Bale sells and kills me every time with the multiple dark jokes and hilarious scenes. Song so catchy, most people probably don't listen to the lyrics, but they should, because it's not just about the pleasures of conformity and the importance of friends, it's also a personal statement about the band itself. Hey, Paul! Ah! I'm sorry, Watson. Unfortunately, it appears my deductions were correct. Not so fast. Look, she left a note. See, Holmes? It says here, these are test results. She has gonorrhea. Seven is a classic. I don't know what else to tell you that hasn't already been said. Everything Fincher is good at is pictured here in this two-hour thrilling mystery. The characters are always the highlight in Fincher's movies. Somerset and Mills are well written. Freeman and Pitt have great chemistry. And instead of being your average buddy cop flick, it crams in messaging perfectly. And examines simply how fucked up society is with grim and depressing atmosphere. Fincher uses the seven deadly sins as a contradiction for everyone who lives in the fucked up society where if you don't resist temptation, you fall weak to apathy. The scene where Somerset joins Mills and his wife for dinner is a perfect example of how innocent everything feels. Until that one hell of a third act happens and John Doe turns David into wrath by killing him. But while I love this movie, I have one more movie just like it that Fincher managed to top. I'll screw you! Cut it out, man! It's not your fault. <laughs> Why is it so hard? I didn't know it was gonna be so hard! <laughs> Good Will Hunting is one of my favorite dramas of all time. It's well written and the characters are fantastic. I relate a lot to Will in this movie. He's a guy who is very gifted with IQ but spends his time being a janitor at MIT and going out with his friends simply because he is afraid to take that next step in life. Robin Williams takes on the task of being his therapist. I love how both of these guys learn from each other and become friends beyond therapy. The scene at the park is one of my favorite scenes of all time. I love that this movie teaches you how to conquer your fears and take responsibility in your own life before it's too late. I don't like early stage Ben Affleck, but this was definitely the first time he gave a great performance. The scene where Chucky tells Will to not be there one day without saying goodbye when he goes over to pick him up is one of Ben Affleck's best scenes in his career. Everyone gives an Oscar worthy performance and I personally think that this should have won best picture over Titanic. This one still remains a smart and intuitive masterpiece. <laughs> Catch Me If You Can is one of the more exciting Spielberg movies. Spielberg often tells dramatic and thrilling stories, but this one sprung him back to his days of blockbusters and entertaining stories. It's cool to see Leonardo DiCaprio do a more childish and weedier role since you don't see him do it that often. Tom Hanks was also very funny in this film. His back and forth chemistry with DiCaprio is fun to watch. While there are more Spielberg movies on this list, this one is still an entertaining watch. A portion of the Francis Scott Key Bridge has collapsed. You see what happened down into the harbor. That large boat collided with the bridge around 1.30 this morning. The Bridge on the River Kwai is one of my favorite war movies. One of the best examples of they don't make them like they used to. You can't really compare this movie to movies like Inglorious Bastards or Saving Private Ryan because they're different war movies accomplishing different things. And it really comes down to personal preference. To me, the best thing this movie accomplishes is what a lot of war movies don't do nowadays, which is the trials and trips tribulations of World War II. A lot of movies that dive into the specifics of World War II don't really teach you much besides war is bad. The best character is General Nicholson, who is misguided and for a good majority of the movie acts as a protagonist and antagonist. David Lean's style was honestly the guideline on how to make an epic film at the time. The music is great, the cinematography is beautiful, and this movie has one of my favorite climaxes in all of film. The final moment where Nicholson realizes what he has done while getting blown away and detonating the explosives blowing up the bridge and the train going down with it shows how grand this film truly is. It's called Smell Yo Dick by Risqué. I ain't that bitch you want to play with. F drop them boxes. Let me smell your dick.
What do you know, a three-way tie. I guess you can call this the sci-fi allegiance round, with Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Blade Runner, and 2001 A Space Odyssey. I think Close Encounters is one of those Spielberg movies where people look at the runtime and say, I don't want to watch a two and a half hour sci-fi drama. That sounds boring. Well, newsflash, you're boring and this movie is fucking awesome. This is also my favorite Richard Dreyfuss performance. The fact that this man gave up his family just to pursue the existence of UFOs is funny as hell on its own, but give some well-acted scenes of him. The cinematography is my favorite in any Spielberg movie. The final scene where they make contact with the alien does thematically pay off. 2001 A Space Odyssey, like I said, is usually considered the greatest sci-fi movie of all time, and I honestly could agree with that. The phrase that gets thrown around a lot when talking about this movie is, it's ahead of its time. And that it was. HAL 9000 is one of the scariest villains of all time. The effects have held up extremely well, the way it depicts space travel is haunting and mesmerizing. The way this film goes from ape to man to technology is mind-blowing in the way it's represented since it came out in 1968. I love this movie and everything about it. The ending is iconic and I'm just saying, if I was in Dave's position, I would shit my pants. Blade Runner, on the other hand, is a more futuristic movie about a detective hunting down replicants, including one he later falls for. The production design is one of this movie's selling points. It's cool, dark, bright, and the rain adds a nice touch. Rick Deckard goes from a washed-up alcoholic to learning from Rugger Hauer's character, and that Tears in the Rain monologue is truly something else. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. <laughs> Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the Tenhauser Gate. All those moments will be lost in time. Like <coughs> tears. All these movies are great in their own way and have influenced the genre for years to come. The Pixar Round. Pixar was definitely my childhood animation company with a dice of DreamWorks and Disney, but Pixar's golden age is something you can never replicate. I loved their never-ending experimentation during this time. The Incredibles is one of the greatest superhero movies of all time. You have a great storyteller in Brad Bird who tells a story of a man who wants to relive his glory days while casting his family aside, and learning that he is stronger with his family behind him. Michael Giacchino's iconic score, the unforgettable characters make this a timeless family film. But Ratatouille ends up being my most watched Pixar movie, it's also the one that me and my brother can quote word for word. Remy is one of my favorite characters ever, the idea of him having to find his identity because he is a rat who ends up going against the odds for his passion is really a powerful message. A lot of the characters in this film represent people who struggle between their arrogance over empathy. Whether it be the dad, Colette, or Chef Skinner, this movie doesn't shy away from teaching kids how to overcome and separate representation with passion. Soul is also my favorite Pixar movie to come out in the last 10 years. This movie reminded me of how much I loved Pixar and everything it taught me during my younger years. Joe is the most relatable Pixar character to me. He's a guy who thought music was his whole life and chased it for years without taking a break to realize everything else he had. The scene where he gets out of performing and realizes it's not as fulfilling as he thought and goes home reminiscing about everything he had in life, even if it was little, and learns to cherish it. The first time I saw this movie, I admit I didn't get it the first time I around, but a year later when I decided to give it another shot, I loved and was amazed at how much I loved it the second time. And this movie reminds you to cherish every second of your life. Jesus, there's a little boy on the track! 
This is a tie between my favorite sports movies. First, Moneyball. This movie just does everything right, from the editing, the feel and message of looking beyond the obvious. It's surprising not many people mention this movie. Aaron Sorkin, who has established himself as a phenomenal screenwriter with The Social Network, wrote an intuitive piece of material that is smart, funny, and engaging. Brad Pitt plays Billy Bean and gives a great performance. Jonah Hill also proved that he can branch out of comedy and gives terrific performances. Moneyball just is the perfect sports movie. Ford v Ferrari on the other hand is a roller coaster. James Mangold, who I've always shown extreme admiration for his writing and directing with films like Logan and Walk the Line. I saw this movie back when it came out and I loved it. Christian Bell and Matt Damon were both robbed respectfully at the Oscars. The way this movie signifies Ken Miles' legacy is done well. The final race at the Le Mans is intense as hell and built up to in great fashion. If you want me to summarize both of these movies, they both should have won Best Picture in their respective years. Why, what, what, were we? Were we blades in that one? That's fucking tight. If there's any movies that I watch the most, it's comedy movies. I'm going to talk about my favorite comedy duologies. First, Rush Hour. Rush Hour, like most buddy cop movies, takes the generic idea of two opposites that become friends, but this was one of the first to do it, and it perfected it. Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker play off each other extremely well. While Rush Hour is by far the better buddy cop movie, I rewatch Rush Hour 2 a lot more. Me and my brother could quote this whole movie, especially the first 20 minutes. If that fourth movie ever comes out, I hope it becomes what the third movie was meant to be. 21 Jump Street though is by far my favorite string of buddy cop flicks, led by the endlessly talented Lord and Miller who I've praised time and time again with films like the Lego Movie and Spider-Verse. They prove that not only can we make great anime movies for kids and adults, but we can make funny as hell comedy movies. Every time I watch these movies, me and my family laugh too hard that our stomachs start hurting. I'm still praying that we will one day get the Men in Black crossover or a well-deserved third movie because it's just too good to only end on two films. Do it for joy! Hands up, Jerry! With this one, we're going to be talking about my favorite war films. There Will Be Blood is one of the most enthralling experiences I've had watching a movie. This movie examines how corrupt capitalism truly can get, and the character of Daniel Plainview being the example. I mentioned earlier how I like when movies can make me relate or get heavily invested with psychopathic characters, and Daniel Day-Lewis embodies this guy. This movie also ends with so many things happening, from Daniel showing how he only wanted domination, disowning HW, and bashing Eli's head in. All that happening in the final act is some of the raw stuff to see unfold. Saving Matt Damon is the most emotional war film, and a movie that checks off the one thing that all war movies nowadays forget good characters. Movies like 1917 and Dunkirk always focus on the effects and trauma of war. This movie does the same but makes it more effective with characters you get to know and care for. This also might be the best directed Spielberg movie with him changing the classic blockbuster formula he is known for. But if Spielberg made the most emotional war movie, Quentin Tarantino made the most self-aware war movie. All the characters are great from Hans to Bridget, Aldo Rain, and BJ Novak staring at me with the face of can you believe this is great. This movie's entire goal is to satirize and get people to see what happened within World War II wasn't bad and it works. But by the end of this movie I am hyped in my couch watching Hitler and the Nazis be blown away and the glorification of violence be justified. Oh, well, you just gonna put them in a drawer? What are you, like, filing them? Yes, for tax reasons. Jews don't die, they just slowly depreciate and then are eventually written off. The best picture around. First, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. This is just one of those movies that I fell in love with the first time I watched it. The subject matter, especially with it documenting the individuality of people and regaining your identity. By the end, when Bromden kills Jack, he wins back his freedom after getting lobotomized, and Chief escapes leaving him free to live a normal life. Nurse Ratchet is an insane bitch, and Louise Fletcher does a good job at making the villain so good that she is despised. Everyone from Brad Dorif and obviously Jack Nicholson steals the scenery. Rocky, like Sylvester Stallone has stated, is a love story. Rocky was a character written with the intention of being relatable and starts off as a loser who knows it. Within this movie he challenges himself, finds love, and gains confidence through his undying perseverance. This movie also has an all-star cast with Stallone, Carl Weathers, Talia Shire, and Burgess Meredith. Both of these earn Best Picture and it looks cooler when you realize they won it back to back in two years. The person I'm dressed at is not fat and not gay. The incredibly fat and gay skinny straight man? Just give
give us some fucking candy! The Outsiders just might be my favorite coming of age movie. Everything from the relatable characters, the score, cinematography, and the genuine feel of this movie. The novel by S.E. Hinton is one of my favorite books, and I'm never too interested into reading books anymore. When I watched the original version, I did think the book was better and the movie rushed the story, but when I watched the complete novel, I loved it a lot more. It included a lot of things that was left out. You have more time for characters like Tuba and Soda Pop to get growth. The way it depicts war between the lower class and upper class within the story is good because deep down every kid here wants peace but live thinking bad about each other and the music helps evoke the message speaking of the music one nitpick i have about the complete novel is that there are scenes like the end battle or dallas winston getting himself killed where the music gets replaced by awkward tone music <laughs> See what I mean? Despite what I think both versions do better, it's a great movie. Regardless of your characteristics, you could somehow relate to Dallas Winston or Daryl Curtis. It's an iconic movie with a star-studded cast that everyone should check out. Hey guys, I heard an assistant professorship just opened up. Whoa, yeah. At the University of Psych! Aww. The Graduate is the movie that taught everybody about moving on in life and learning to adapt into adulthood. Benjamin is the embodiment of learning to solve your own problems and knowing you can't solve anything by just jumping into someone's arms. The ending of this movie is rewarding and the best at any movie. When Ben and Elaine run out of the church knowing there will be consequences as Hello Darkness My Old Friend plays in the background, it's a great way to end this story. I scat to the left and I scat to the right. How about you? Impossible. Can't shoot this. The Matrix is one of the most revolutionary stories in Hollywood of all time. Your reality is what you believe in, and just like Star Wars is about embracing imagination in film, this movie embraces reality and the different interpretations of human perception. Nowadays, you can't go a single damn day without referring to someone as stuck in the Matrix, with people completely overutilizing and forgetting the whole point and concept of the Matrix. But besides that, this movie is fucking awesome. The character in Neo represents any average Joe who faces transformation at some point in their life, and knowledge prevailing blind faith. The side characters are great, the world building is interesting, and the visuals and action are just well put together. I keep hearing stupid arguments for why this movie is overrated, and I'm just saying, how could you watch scenes like this and say that? <laughs> Dodge this. That right there is just fucking cool. <sighs> Probably shouldn't have milked that landing. I love 80s movies, and here are all the ones that stick out to me the most. The Goonies is a classic family film that you never see anymore, and when it gets replicated, it sucks. Oh. The balls. Richard Donner, who was always a talent for making fun blockbusters like Superman or Lethal Weapon, makes a movie that is fun for both demographics. Overall, great movie anyone would enjoy. Ferris Bueller is by far the icon of a generation. This is also the funniest movie of the batch. Every character is either funny, witty, or relatable. This isn't over yet, Buster. Do you read me? Uh, loud and clear, Mr. Peterson. Call me sir, God damn it! Yes, yes, yes sir, yes sir! The, the best thing about this movie, and really all John Hughes movies, is how they capture and remind kids of their youth. I mean, I sure as hell can relate to characters like Cameron Fry and John Bender, which is also why Breakfast Club is a staple not just 80s films, but movies in general. You really can recapture what Hughes did with putting random stereotypical kids and make them all relate to each other in a way. Beetlejuice is one of the funniest movies I have ever seen. It's one of my favorite Tim Burton movies. It's got great set design, music, writing, and a lot of more stuff that I'm probably not even thinking of. Michael Keaton steals the show, obviously, and made this guy one of the most familiar faces in film. Gremlins is another one that I love. It's one of my favorite Christmas slash horror movies. A story of creatures going rabid after feeding them past midnight and then taking over a town is creative, and setting it during Christmas is genius. Gizmo is my favorite creature character ever. He is just as adorable as he is lovable. The only thing that sucks about this movie is that it spawned terrible gremlins ripoffs. Hey, hey, Jefferson, check it out. Chick getting nailed on my head. Sweet. Hey, Teddy, pass the word down to Frankenstein. 
Oh, ha, ha. Alfred Hitchcock is one of my favorite directors. There are more of his films that I like, but these ones stand out. Rear Window is a classic movie. This movie started the trend of making movies that are set in one location. Sure, you see other areas, but either through binocular lenses or to feed information. The script is wonderful, James Stewart is charming, and the climax is incredible. Vertigo is a perfect movie, and I don't throw that term lightly. I might give movies like the Batman 10s, but there is sometimes one issue I have with films that I give 10s. This film takes a bunch of cliches that weren't as overused used as they are now and cranks that bitch up to 100 and crafts a mindfuck of a story. The camera work is my favorite in any of his films, the twist blows your mind and the ending truly fucks with you. But North by Northwest as of right now is my favorite Hitchcock film. This film also has a twist that takes you for a spin. It also has some of my favorite action sequences like the plane hunting Roger or the Mount Rushmore standoff. Everything about these movies are special and fun if you're a fan of thrillers. Stanley Kubrick always stated how he never wanted to make the same film twice, so when he made the greatest satire ever and the greatest sci-fi film ever, it was only natural that he made the greatest sci-fi thriller of all time. Taking elements from his previous movies and mashing it together, whether it be the iconic sets and production, the incredible music by Wendy Carlos, and the controversial messaging that you're obviously not going to get right away. Alex is the best character Kubrick ever adapted. He is a psychopathic individual who adores violence, milk, and Beethoven. After he has gone through immense therapy, you find out that no matter what, you can't fix crazy and deep down that is just a part of being human. And no one else could have done it better than Kubrick. If I pull that off, will you die? It would be extremely painful. You're a big guy. Fight! Next up, the superhero films I like in the genre. Batman is a classic. Before Nolan came in to make the best Batman movies, Burton had to make THE Batman movie. This movie is iconic, it's quotable, Michael Keaton rocks, the art direction is incredible, and Jack Nicholson, just like every movie he is in, steals the show. Superman is also one of the greats, it's a beautiful story about love, heroism, and truth. Christopher Reeves is still the best Superman to date, in fact the whole cast is great. I mean you got Gene Hackman, Ned Beatty, Margot Kidder, and Marlon Brando. It's a charming movie that never gets old. The other Dark Knight movies that aren't the Dark Knight, that just tells you how high the Dark Knight's going to be. The other movies though are fantastic. The Dark Knight Rises does a great job of wrapping up the story. Bane makes a good villain and Batman's arc of escaping the pit is awesome. Batman Begins is still the best Batman origin movie, no doubt. This movie pulls a Batman ninja of sorts as he goes through training and fulfills the role of protector for the first half, as him learn how hard it is to balance both sides of life and understand it doesn't matter who he is, but what he does that defines him. If only other superhero movies today would follow this formula. We are thirsty, we will drink. Who is still the water oh, from the cheek? Oh, I break your back, I make you humble. Lawrence of Arabia is the greatest epic ever made. Everything within this movie is grand, the spectacle, the characters, the scale, direction, and musical and visual form a story. This movie tells the story of T.E. Lawrence and how he went against everything he stood for and became the person to unite every group to support Britain. Peter O'Toole leads this film and is easily one of the greatest leading men of all time. This is a movie worthy of the four hour runtime. I'm looking at you Zack Snyder. David Lee managed to prove twice in a row how to make a perfect epic film. Hey! I'm walking here! I'm walking here! You're going to see Martin Scorsese take a couple of slots in the later half of this list. And Taxi Driver is still one of his greatest contributions. During quarantine back in 2020, I watched a lot of old movies on my bucket list. And this one surprised me with its message of how society treats people if they commit crazy acts, and Travis Bickle being a symbol for insanity and loneliness. I love the music, the retro feel is captivating, and this film managed to age extremely well. You're jelly. Uh, I am not. I don't think he's ready. Soups is jelly. Stop it. I don't think he's ready for this. Uh. The Lego Movie is one of the most entertaining movies I've ever seen. I made an essay on why I love this movie and everything it achieves, but as time has gone on, I've appreciated it a lot more than I already did. This movie combines two things I love, in Lego and animation, making one of the most revolutionary styles in animation in the last decade. Chris Pratt plays an animated character that he's actually good at playing. The story is awesome and the emotion and messaging is creative and overall one of my favorite animated movies. Oh my god, I cannot believe that this is passed on into 
Shrek. Reservoir Dogs just might be my favorite heist film. This film came out in a time where Tarantino introduced a different form of telling a story, and in that he made all of Hollywood want to make exactly what he was making in Reservoir Dogs influenced a lot more than people think. Taking a crime story of seven men hired to rob a store in a non-linear fashion, while also taking time to explain how the men got hired in the roles while all of them wonder why the plan crumbled and investigate if there is a rat amongst them, while not showing the heist at all is ingenious. But while this film is great, Tarantino has some ones I like better. 